and then sneezed violently, causing his skin and flesh to whirl up into the air like a cloud of brown snowflakes that swirled and faded, leaving a skeleton behind that promptly collapsed, eliciting some screams from the watching wizard. Welcome back, folks, to another Ed Time story. I am here with Ed Greenwood, the man himself, original creator of the Forgotten Realms and many other settings. Uh, I am wondering, Ed, though, for these Ed Time stories, what do you enjoy about writing things like short narrative fiction that you don't get from writing, uh, like, realms lore, like we usually have on the channel? Well, it, gets, it gives you a chance to share, share history, lore, the way people in the realms would get it. It's a minstrel or bard telling you a story in a tavern. And, and, you know, it might be wrong, it might be exaggerated, but that's the way they get their history. So if you're enjoying these videos, be sure to like, subscribe, be sure to turn on notifications so you can be alerted to the next videos coming out. Uh, also consider becoming a protector of the realms. If you go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood, the support from the Patreon is what directly contributes to us being able to make these videos. So uh, please enjoy this short story. The Night of Too Many Wizards. Far away and long ago, there was a very old and lonely king who thought he should marry and have heirs to sit on his throne after he was gone. For he had heard from his bards and viziers of what happened to kingdoms who died without crown princesses or princes. Barons and bold bad warlords made war on each other and any people in the way to try to claim the empty thrones, and whatever else happened, those thrones ended up drenched with blood. So the king sent word by his herald to the kingdom next door that he would be pleased indeed to woo its proud princess to be his bride. He had heard she was young and very pretty and forceful and could ride well and slay dragons with elegant ease. Could there be a more ideal queen? Yet his herald returned looking glum, bearing a scroll that he handed the old king without a word. And it read, To your majesty, these words. Forgive the blunt and common speech that follows, but I desire to be very clear. I will never marry any crazed old man. I crave adventure and new things and bright futures. Old folk cannot provide such things, and you are undeniably old. I wish you happy memories and warm tea as you recall your glorious but fading past and relax on your throne going on being old. I wish you all joy of being old. However, being old is not for me, trusting you shall understand a much younger princess. Dear me, quoth the lonely old king, and he sighed an old sigh. He was good at it. He had been sighing for a long time. Young these days. He sat in silent thought for a long time and then rang for tea. How bold, he exclaimed, after it had been brought and had begun to grow cool. How forward, he added firmly sometimes later when the dregs were cold. How rude, he exclaimed forcefully and drew the dagger at his belt and flung it the length of the throne room into the usual statue pool. The three courtiers ducked aside from the whirling blade with practiced ease and the understeward of the statue calmly reached for the rake to retrieve the dagger, and then stood to attention, for the king was speaking again. Well, if this is the current popular sentiment amongst suitable princesses, I must do something about my oldness, the king said even more firmly. Herald, go and summon my royal wizard. The herald neither bowed nor withdrew, but coughed discreetly. <coughs> The king looked down from his throne. The herald coughed again, <laughs> then said, Your majesty, the royal wizard is dead these three years. The lonely old king blinked. Oh. Then he frowned. Oh. Then he set his jaw, accepted his dripping dagger from the understeward, polished it dry on his doublet, and commanded, Herald, summon every wizard in the kingdom to me here without delay. I wish to be young again, and shall reward the mage who can lastingly make me so, with our strength, looks, and agility to match, with the title of Royal Wizard, and thrice his weight in gold annually by way of salary, plus expenses, 
spacious and well-appointed chambers in the old wing and my third best cook. The herald bowed very low, then straightened and cried, At once, your majesty, and hurried out. And with a sigh, the king rang for fresh tea. It took a ten day and ten nights too, but there came an eleventh night when the king shuffled to his throne after supper to discover the throne room crowded with men and women and other beings. A veritable throng of them, some as tall and thin as saplings, some as squat and gnarly as old stumps, and most somewhere in between. They seemed to share a fondness for ankle-length robes and silly pointed hats. I trust, the lonely old king said, looking out over this many-hued, mismatched army, my herald has acquainted you with the reason I summoned you here. There was a nodding rumble very far from being sufficiently in unison to be called anything approaching a chorus of assent. Your Majesty, the herald said smoothly from the foot of the throne, we judged it safest if they tried their magics one at a time, so I took the liberty of assigning them all a number, so we could have an orderly cue. Wise indeed, the lowly old king agreed. We concur. Let it commence, then. The herald bowed low, turned on his heel from the king to face the motley assembled mages, and called, Wizard the First, stand forth. A cowled figure floated forward to a silent and somehow menacing stop. Work your magic, the herald commanded. The figure raised a hand, wriggled its fingers in an oddly fluid way, and said something that made a tiny bird fall out of its cowl in an apparent faint, or worse, dropping to the floor in a trail of feathers. The lonely old king's crown shot up to the ceiling, followed by his teacup, but not the tea, which slumped wetly all over the left gilded lion's head arm of the throne. The lonely old king felt nothing, not even a tingle, and said so. The herald stared at him consideringly, then nodded and turned to coldly wave the cowled figure away, and grandly declaim, Wizard the Second, stand forth! Something that looked like a small colony of winking lights orbiting an undulating vine wriggled forward. Work your magic! The winking lights spewed two large purple explosions that left plumes of drifting smoke behind, but seemed to do nothing else at all. The lonely old king flipped open the right arm of the throne so he could peer down at himself in the mirror well built into it, but he could see no change in himself at all. He gave himself an airy wave and settled back to await the next wizard, for the winking lights were already dejectedly gliding away to a side door. Wizard the Third, stand forth! This mage looked rather like the king, if the king had replaced his crown with a pointy hat that had a bend in the middle, and his rich robes and doublet with a food-stained old grey robe, that is. When the herald bade him work his magic, the wizard nodded gravely, muttered something as he cast a green powder into the air, and then sneezed violently, causing his skin and flesh to whirl up into the air like a cloud of brown snowflakes that swirled and faded leaving a skeleton behind that promptly collapsed, eliciting some screams from the watching wizard. Went the wrong way, someone muttered. Shouldn't have sneezed. The herald glared, got silence, and into it called, Wizard the Fourth, stand forth. The king peered around for his tea. Surely there was tea. It proved to be a very long night, a nine cups of tea night, a night of a parade of wizards far beyond what the king bothered to recall, though the one that brought part of the roof down did stick in his memory. Two of them did manage to project the image of a handsome, wildly grinning young man into the air in front of the king's face, but he was able to peer around one of these illusions, and the other flickered annoyingly and then faded away before he could draw two breaths. There came a late hour, or rather, a very early one, when a decidedly disconsolate air had settled over the relatively few wizards who remained. The king himself 
had already concluded that the magic available to him wasn't going to make him young, no matter what else happened. Which was when a stir arose from behind the remaining wizards. Am I too late? came a quavering voice. The herald peered. The old king peered. Wizards were turning and then parting, like curtains drawn aside to reveal the royal bed. To reveal an old crone in a filthy black dress and shawl, leaning on a thornwood staff. Witch! One of the wizards hissed. Witch! Another echoed. Evil witch, get you gone. Witch! 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 A chant went up. The king drew in breath for another sigh, but someone else sighed first and far more loudly. You really shouldn't malign witches, the old crone said. They do a lot of good. Sometimes I wish I was one. A wizard sneered. You deny being a witch? Witch? Oh, yes, the old crone replied with a smile. You see? And suddenly magic was roiling like glowing smoke, and in the heart of it something scaly and huge was towering up towards the throne room ceiling and looking down with eyes golden and bright and as large as shields. I happen to be a dragon. The smile that the cinnamon brown worm favored the throne room with then had far too many teeth gleaming in it for anyone's comfort. Wizards and courtiers alike shrieked and fled in all directions like scurrying mice. However, the lonely old king noted with approval that the herald, though quaking with fear and casting wild looks up at the throne, stood his ground. When the doors were finished banging, the room was quite devoid of wizards, assembled or otherwise. Yet now, full of dragon, huge and bat-winged, and with a long tail coiled up behind it that completely filled the back of the throne room, statues and their pools and all. And the dragon was unhurriedly adding, A dragon who's not hungry just now, as I've just eaten a bold young princess in the kingdom next door. So be at ease, O king. Now, I may be neither witch nor wizard, but I have a little magic. Why have you need of it? To be young again, so I can marry a princess of childbearing age, and give my kingdom an heir ere I die, uh, to save my people from a throne war. The dragon stared at him, then said slowly, You tell truth. I have magic enough to know so. An admirable reason to take a mate. What do you look for in a wife? A kindness, a liking for tea, someone to discuss books with, someone to hold when I need comfort, or, or she does. The dragon sighed almost happily, tea. And then magic was roiling like glowing smoke again, and in the heart of it, the dragon was sinking down and no longer looming large. No one can make you younger, O king, the worm added, and you are already wise and good enough to be a good father so I can be your queen. If you'll have me, I promise not to eat you. And the last of the smoke drifted away, curling and fading, and the king and his herald stared not at a crone nor a towering brown-scaled dragon, but a strong and imperious-looking, beautiful young princess, the spitting image of the proud princess of the kingdom next door, to be precise, though the king did not say so, for he was wise. He was, in fact, wise enough to say, uh, Yes, if you'll have me, that is. And he got down off his throne and knelt. I will, the princess replied, lifting him to his feet as if he weighed nothing, but as gently as if he was as fragile as a teacup. Now, let's have tea, and Harold, plan a simple proclamation and tell someone to prepare a suitable room as a royal nursery. And so it was that the old king grew lonely no more, and wiser than ever, and many cattle raw, and much tea properly brewed, became customary charges upon the royal treasury. As the begetting of a long line of heirs got underway, and the fame of the Dragon Realm began. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak, and this time around, we're doing this. Vangradahast. The court wizard, royal magician, both, um, who really ran Cormir, the kingdom of Cormir in the realms, for much of the reign of Azun the Fourth. 
Vanger de Hast, which is why he was nicknamed Vanji, because people were having trouble getting through Vanger de Hast, and they stumble over his name. And he was everywhere, and he ran everything. He considered himself Cormier, and if you, well, he was sort of like Hoover in the FBI. Um, that's probably too old a reference for most of you. Let's put it this way. He considered himself the kingpin in the kingdom of Cormier. Vanguard Hast. And he was a... The end justifies the means. So he was not a nice man. But he had good, like, spirit at heart. And he was a former apprentice of Elminster and resented Elminster terribly because of if you want to see a little repartee between them, find the right volume in my Sage of Shadowdale trilogy, and there'll be a nice little back and forth. And there's also one in, um, Elminster Hill, one of the flashbacks. Yes. Mm -hmm. 